It's my pleasure to speak to you from the scriptures this afternoon. And my preaching text is Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I'll pause for a moment in prayer. Father in heaven, a time is short and we are weak. I would ask, Father, that you would grant us your grace now to receive the word of God, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God which performs its work amongst us. We pray that we would receive your word with a willing heart. We would treasure it, nurture it, remember it, and that with the passage of time, it would bear much fruit so that we may stand before you blameless and not ashamed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been a long, 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 long time, hasn't it? It's been a long time since God appeared to Abraham in Genesis chapter 3. And he said to Abraham, go forth from your country, go forth from your relatives and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and many nations will come forth from you and I will bless those who bless you and in you all the families, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. In you, Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There's tremendous weight and significance in those words. Because the Almighty God is promising Abraham that through him, from, him, from his descendants, one who will, will come who will bring the blessing of God. And the curse of God that has fallen upon mankind in the Garden of Eden is going to be lifted. As Paul says, as far as the curse is found, it will be done away with. Not straight away, but it will come. And it is coming. And for generation after generation after generation, through trial and tribulation and sorrow and sin and pain and exodus and the return to the land, God's people have been waiting, haven't they? They're waiting for the fulfillment of that promise. They're waiting for that blessing. They know it's coming. And they know that the Old Testament sacrifices of the lamb and so forth are just an outward shadow. They're waiting for the reality of the shadow. And now, when Jesus Christ, that perfect man, ascends to the hill, seeing the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he speaks forth his blessing. That perfect man has brought the blessing of God long promised to go to Abraham. And now everything that God promised to Abraham, to the Jewish people, and to the nations of the world has come to pass. As I said, not everything on day one, but it has come. And it is coming. More to come. And it will come, finally, completely, in the new heavens and the new earth. As I said, my text is, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It's not poetry, you know. It's real, and it's true. Now the first blessed is blessed are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit is like a man who's taken a journey on the ferry, on the overnight ferry from Manila Bay to Cebu, and he's been washed overboard. 
in the night and it's dark and he's cold and he is des in desperate circumstances and he knows he's going to die until an arm reaches out in the night and it's a fisherman who has found in him and he says hang on to my arm and he does and he hangs on to that fisherman's arm with all his strength but he can, because he knows he is in desperate circumstances. The poor in spirit are like a man who has taught rebellion against his king and he's been placed in a prison and he's awaiting his death sentence. And then a letter arrives from the king with his name on it and it says, you have been pardoned and you are welcome to return to the king's palace. We are reconciled and to come into my presence. And he seizes hold of that letter and he never lets it go because he knows he is in desperate circumstances. And there is the word for him of hope and blessing. The next blessing is blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Those who mourn are those who are aware, they understand, they feel within themselves that sense of shame. It's probably the best word I can think of, or disgrace, because of what they have said, and what they have done, and what they have wanted, which they thought would make them happy but which brought hurt to others and to themselves. And they mourn for that darkness within. And no food or drink or technology or entertainment, no new, bright, shiny thing that they can purchase at gateways can remove that sense of disgrace. And they sorrow and they lament and they find sin to be bitter. I hope that's how you find sin. They find sin to be bitter, but Jesus is sweet, and so they are comforted in him. And upon these persons, these desperate people we might say, Jesus, sorry, God puts his smile of approval. The word blessed, 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 it means the approval or the smile or the applause of God. It's amazing. It's wonderful. There is fallen humanity. And for those who mourn, for those who are poor in spirit, he, God puts his applause and his smile and it rests upon them. And then our text this afternoon, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I want to talk about that meekness. I'm going to say three things about that meekness. How we get it, what it looks like, and the strength that comes from it. How do we get it? What does it look like when we have it? And the strength that comes with meekness. I'll just point out that in verses 3 and 4 it's more to do with our relationship with God. But in verse 5, our text, it has to do with how our lives are lived out hour by hour, day by day, in the intense and complex relationships of church and families and work. For some Christians, it's lived out amongst are the believers and it's more or less for the most part safe and secure and warm. For others, for many, it's lived out in hostile, sometimes even hateful circumstances and as the early Christians found out, it's very hard. But whatever our circumstances, this meekness is lived out among men and among women, our families, our church, our work, our community. The word means mild or gentle. It was used by the Greeks a long time ago to describe a gentle breeze. There is a calmness about it, about this word meek, but also a strength. In 
In Scripture, it's like a gentle breeze, a gentle breeze that I have felt sometimes at the top of CCM in the evening. And it's like an inner strength and a gentleness, an inner strength. It gives a person a calm composure and wins the smile of God. So, how do we get it? Well, it comes from the miracle of the new creation. You've all heard about the first creation. You've read about it in Genesis chapter 1. And now there's a new creation. It has begun with Jesus Christ. This meekness can only come from the miracle of the new creation or the rebirth that must happen within us because we are stuffed full of, apart from Jesus Christ, we are stuffed full, we are full of I, me, myself, my self-esteem and my story, my plans for happiness and I'm going to follow my dreams and I'm going to have things pretty well the way I want them, thanks very much, and I'll be happy. And I deserve to be happy and I want to be happy and you should help me be happy. That's the way the world thinks, doesn't it? It doesn't naturally think about submitting to God. To submit to God, there has to be the miracle of a changed nature that comes from the new creation. And it's, it's detailed for us beautifully in Ephesians chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul says of the Ephesians, you were dead in your trespass and sins, well, dead, that's pretty dead, like dead, like a piece of wood, like a piece of cheese, like just dead. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. We followed even more. We followed the prince of the power of the earth, that's Satan. We once lived in the passions of our flesh. Boy, you can say that again before I became a Christian. Living in the passions of our flesh, yes. And we were by nature by who we are within children of wrath or of anger, the anger of God. But God, that's a good word, isn't it? But, but God. But God changes the story. God changes everything. We were on a certain path, a certain progression that was going to lead to a certain place that was not very pleasant. We're left to ourselves, we would have run to. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. We were dead, but we were made alive together with Christ. So we have a new person within, new desires, new things we think will make us happy. In short, God, who at the beginning said, let there be light and let there be life, has done a great, I believe it's a greater creation. He's taken fallen man and fallen woman and made them new and perfect in Christ. And we are born again, born again by the Holy Spirit, and as the scripture says, Matthew 18, 3, we become like children. Jesus said, unless you are converted and become like a child, you won't be entering the kingdom of heaven. Not as in naive or foolish or simple, but as in humbled. Diminished is another word that means the same thing. Diminished. I don't think so much of myself as I did even a year ago, I have, been, I have been diminished. I have been humbled. We were dead in trespass and sin. We are one to our King and our Savior. And we are humbled like a child. And we have a new disposition, a new nature, a new inclination as towards what we would like to do and the things that we think would make us happy. So we don't dream of gateways anymore because 
we know it doesn't really make us happy. We may go there, but we don't dream of get happiness at, from gateways. We have a new disposition. We think and dream of pleasing our master and our king and our savior. And as I said above, it has to be a work of God. It must be a work of God. There's no other way it can happen, is there? And it is so contrary to the spirit of our age. The motto of our age is, I did it my way. Have you heard that? Well, there was a, an American singer called Frank Sinatra, and he made that very, very popular. That was his most famous song, I Did It My Way. And if you came to Australia and came to a funeral, you'll probably hear someone putting on that record, I did it my way. What a thing to say before you enter into eternity. Frank, Frank Sinatra sang, I did it my way, and that was an accurate summary of his life and his death. People want others to know that they do it their way, not man's way, not God's way. No, no, no. That would be weak and foolish. My way, or... As the English poet said, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And that is the path to manhood and happiness. Chart your own course. Why would you follow some, some book? And again, that is antithetical, contrary against our text and against the Christian faith. There is no trust there. I'm just describing you the spirit of our age and how men live, how men live and how they die. There has to be a work of God that changes us lest we be caught up in the spirit of our age. I remember many years ago, I was talking to a friend who had been friends for a long, long, long time, and we, I had been seeking to persuade to win him to Christ. And we were talking late at night, as we often did, and we went down to the beach, and it was quiet, and the, the moon was shining over the water, the stars were sparkling in the, in the sky, and I persuaded him to pray a prayer. And he did pray the prayer. And I said, and he said to me, oh, look, that's, that's, that's wonderful. I, I, I feel new. I feel all new. And I said to him the next day, well, would you like to come to church with me? And he said, no, I'll do it my way. And I knew right then that he was stillborn, born dead, dead to God and dead to his blessings. He wanted to do it his way. Now, if you're not a Christian, the idea of doing things God's way will not really make much sense because you have all your life thought of happiness in doing things your way. But there is a deeper happiness, a deeper joy that comes from doing things God's way. And that's how it is for we Christians. We no longer say my way, we say it's his way. Our Father, our Maker, our Savior, and our King. Thy kingdom come. Meekness comes from this, when we bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Meekness is sourced in the new birth. It comes from heaven. It's a wonderful gift from God which comes from the new birth. It flows from this. It's lived out amongst men, our family, our church, our, and our community, but it comes from Him, and it is renewed from Him as we constantly recommit our lives to Him. It must begin here. If it hasn't begun here for you with the new creation, it hasn't begun. Now, the next thing I want to look at is, what does it look like? 
well, do we become effeminate? I don't think so. I want to explain to you what it looks like. We become meek before God. What does it look like? What does meekness look like? We become meek before God, under the hand of God. We become meek under the hand of God because the scriptures plainly teach us that he is the ruler of the heavens and the earth. There are no random or out of control events. None. Isaiah 49, 6 says, Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no one else. I am God declaring the end from the beginning, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So he, him, the king, he knows the past, he's ruled over the past. He knows the present, he's ruling over everything now. He knows everything that will ever happen because he decides everything that will ever happen by his decrees. He decrees what has not yet happened. That's what Isaiah is saying. For I am, the, I am God declaring the end from the beginning, saying my purpose will be established. I will do as I please. Nothing happens in this world but by his direct agency or his direct control or his permission. Nothing is independent of him. You know, just flying around sort of out of control. It just happens and he didn't know about it. It was just an accident. Nothing happens which is independent of him. If things happened that were independent of him, he would no longer be the supreme being. But he is. And he rules over all things. So all things are mediated or come to us through the hand of God. Including that arrow that was shot through the air at random and went zinging through the air way up, up, down, down, down and found its way right under the armpit of King Ahab, which caused him to bleed to death. That's what happened. The scripture says that that arrow was directed by God. And he exsanguinated. He was a villain and deserved to. Bled to death. So, we become meek under the Lord's hand. He controls all things. And his rule is constant. It doesn't waver on and off like electricity sometimes. It just stops. Or the internet. His rule is thorough. Thorough. As in no details or mist or unknown to him. He knows when the sparrow falls to the ground. He regularly counts the hairs of your head. Just to assure you that he knows, Jesus says that, just to assure you that he knows everything and his care is thorough. There are no missing details that he's thinking, what about? He knows. And his rule is pastoral or caring or loving. I am the good shepherd, declared Jesus Christ. Well, thank you, God in heaven, for that. Here we have the good shepherd caring and looking after us. And Jesus says, says this, he says, I want you, I want you disciples to abide or continue in my love. That is, I want you to continually believe and expect that moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, in every and all circumstances, I am ruling over your life in love. Because that's what he is doing. So he says, I want you to abide, remain in my love. Or earlier, abide in me. Abide in my love. Remain in me. Because I am constantly bringing all things together. I am constantly working all things together for good. I am constantly shepherding. He doesn't take a day off. 
He always cares. And so he says, I want you to abide in my love. He can say that. And so, we have him ruling over us. There he is, ruling over us. All things, everything, nothing is missing. And so we are meek. We become meek because of the above, because he's ruling over us. He knows all the hairs of our head. He's constantly caring for us. Because of this, we become meek before him. Meek, humbled. You know what? Some things we can change, some things we can't. Sometimes there is justice and sometimes injustice. Sometimes there is joy and sometimes there is sorrow. Everyone in this room, includes myself, everyone in this room is somewhere on a continuum, I like that word, somewhere on a line between joy and happiness and pleasure. Hey, over here, joy, happiness, pleasure, and suffering and disease and death and pain over here. We're somewhere between here and here. Usually a complex combination of them both. Our lives are a mixture, an admission, a, an admixture of joy and happiness and sorrow and pain. But in all things, wherever you are on the continuum, here and here, in all things we give thanks and we say, Thy will be done. Because we are in submission to Him, our King, our ruler. And He knows what He's doing. And so we submit. We are weak before Him without complaining. <sighs> without resisting. Without grumbling. That he, that's what He wants us to do was beautifully illustrated in the life of Joni Erickson. Most of you will remember that young American girl who dived into the water. It was shallow water and she broke her neck and became in a wheelchair. She couldn't walk. That was when she was 18 years old. And later she wrote, he, he has chosen not to heal me, but to hold me. That's beautiful, isn't it? He has chosen not to heal me, but to hold me. That's meekness under the hand of God. Andrew Brunson, he was a pastor in Turkey. He was arrested as a threat to national security on the charge of being a leading actor in a terrorist group. I see Pastor Ellis over there. He would probably be a leading actor in a terrorist group too. Anyway, Andrew Branson spent a lot of time in a Turkish jail. And he said, let me be clear, I'm not in prison for anything I have done, but because of who I am, a Christian pastor. I miss my wife and children, but it is an honor to suffer for Jesus Christ as many others have before me. He's being meek before God. And we see it beautifully illustrated in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he faces into the impending fire storm. You know, with his fire and wind, and you can hear it coming. Jesus knows what's coming that's why he prayed so fearfully in the Garden of Gethsemane and sweated great drops of blood because there's a firestorm coming and it's like a howling soy noise as the fire sucks everything in. There's this impending firestorm coming and he prays, Luke 22, 42, Father, remove this cup from me, but not my will be done, but yours be done. And he was at peace. He was at rest with what followed afterwards. 
He had come to do his Father's will, and he was meek before God. So meekness is lived out in this world under the hand or under the rule of God. And it flows from that, if we've established that, that we become meek before men. So we're still talking about what it looks like. We become meek before God. We become meek before men. We are meek before men. That's a generic term, by the way, so men and women. We become meek before men because we believe that behind the lips and the actions of men is the hand of God, either caused by him or allowed by him. It's beautifully illustrated in John chapter 11, verse 51. The high priest who hated Jesus and was moved by the spirit of Satan. Remember Jesus said this is the hour of darkness. Yes, it was the hour of darkness. It was Satan's hour. The high priest is in consultation with his fellow priests. So they're all envious and raging against Jesus Christ. And the high priest says to his colleagues, nor do you understand that it is better it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And then John adds, he did not say this of his own accord, but being the high priest, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. That's exactly what the high priest is doing. He's, he's proclaiming the gospel. So that the reader who's reading that, and he's thinking, well, you know, why did, if Jesus is going to, if the Savior, and one day he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron, why is it that he's dying on a Roman cross? And here it is, we have the high priest explaining the gospel from his lips. It is better that one man should die for the people. That's exactly what Jesus is doing. He's dying for his people, isn't he? He's laying down his life for his people. I am the good shepherd and I lay down my life for my sheep. So, comma, any and all abrasions, you know, when you fall over and you knock your skin off, abrasions or hurts that occur as we rub up against one another, which are very real. Any deep sorrows caused by criticisms, sharp words, the times that we have been overlooked or we feel left out or when we suffer illness or pain, loss of worldly goods, happen because he has allowed them to happen. And it is his will that we respond with meekness. So what does it look like? We submit to the hand of God. We submit under men. Paul beautifully illustrates it when he t writes to the church um, oh, in the book of Titus. and he, t he reminds Titus that the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. In other words, not all that easy to get along with. Because the people on Crete with his churches, are liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Not all that easy to get along with. Some, some of you probably know people that are not all that easy to get along with. It's hard just to get on with them. And Paul says, Paul says to the Christians, look, I want you to, amongst these cretins, I want you to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, and be gentle. Same word, gentle. And show perfect courtesy towards all people. So all those cretins, which are not easy to get along with, you have to be respectful and meek, not provoked, not <clears throat> self-asserted, but gentle. And of course, we see it beautifully lived out in the life of our Saviour, don't we? 
He's our hero, isn't he? Isn't he? He's our hero. <laughs> we don't need a hero on television or a comic strip hero like Superman or Ant-Man or those heroes that keep flooding onto our television, uh, onto the, and, and through the cinemas uh, in red costumes and shields and big hammers and that. We have one already. It's Jesus Christ. He's our hero and our saviour. Peter says when he, when Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So there it is. He was meek. Not weak, but meek. And that leads me to my last point. The strength that comes with meekness. It's very, very real. The strength that comes from meekness. It's like, it's like a, I think you've all seen it, it's like a spring of water that flows down the side of a mountain. And it's channeled into a little stream about this big, and it tumbles over a water wheel. And as it does so, it turns that enormous wooden water wheel around and round and grinds the flour or the millet or the rice. There's tremendous strength that comes from meekness. It's like that gentle breeze that refreshes us on our journey. It was this quality of meekness and submission to God and man that made Jesus as strong as spring steel. Steel is hard when you bump into it with your leg, it hurts. Spring steel is also hard, but it flexes, it bends, and it comes back. So it's often used in agriculture and other uses. So it made Jesus meekness, submission to God, and man made Jesus as strong as spring steel. It will flex, it will not break. Jesus, facing the firestorm, prayed in the Garden of Eden, not my will, but thy will be done. And it is his Father's will that he is betrayed, arrested, and the shame of it, given a sham trail and trial in the night, bashed, spat upon by the leaders of his own people, and then turned over to, by them to the power of Rome. And in a few hours... Jesus is dying on the cross. And he's fighting the agony. But he's still, if you can picture this, he's still on the cross in tremendous agony, having great difficulty to breathe. But he's still focusing his mind. He's submitting to his Father's will. And he's focusing his mind. His great mission is to seek and to save the lost. And so he looks at those faces contorted with rage down there who are yelling insults at him and he says, Father, forgive them. He prays for them. He gives pastoral care to the thief at his side. That's what he's doing. And he says, today you shall be with me in paradise. Words of comfort from the good shepherd. He arranges for the welfare of his mother. And as he passes from this world, which is now dark, he cries, into your hands I commit your spirit. That perfect, to the very, very end, to the last words of his life, that perfect composure, calmness, courage, strength comes from his meekness, from a willing submission to his father's will. That meekness made him as strong as spring steel, and he was unbroken. And so it was with the Apostle Paul. Paul writes the church at Corinth, and he appeals to them by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. Oh, there it is again, the gentleness and the meekness of Christ. He's saying to them, as Paul, as Jesus ran his race, 
so do I. How did it work out for Paul? Well, in prison often, beaten, so he almost died, five times given the 39 lashes, three times beaten with sticks, three times shipwrecked and dangers from robbers and danger in the city, in the country and at sea, in dangers from false believers, often cold and naked. Wow. As Jesus was meek and gentle before God and men, so was the Apostle Paul. And I would like you to be the same too. Hmm. Because from that comes courage and determination. We call it grit. G-R-I-T. Grit. There was a movie called True Grit. It's a good one. Mental, spiritual toughness to follow Jesus. And as it was for Jesus and for Paul, so it may be with you. How are you doing with regard to meekness, may I ask? As I said before, you might think, well, it's really a girly thing, you know. Meek girls. Girls are meek, aren't they? Meek and weak. Well, Jesus didn't think so. Paul didn't think so. You may never have submitted yourself to God. You may just have assumed that you're the captain of your soul. That's what everyone else does. And you're free to do it your way. But you're wrong. You're wrong about that. You're not the captain of your soul. And you'll have no blessing from God in this world or the next. Perhaps you're a Christian and you're fighting with God. You're unhappy. You're unhappy with who you married. You're unhappy with your husband. Or you're unhappy with your wife. Or you're happy with your church. Or you're unhappy at work. Or you're unhappy with something that's irritating you and it keeps, you know, like a stone in your shoe. It keeps, just keeps being there and irritating you. You're just unhappy. What you need to do is go back to the beginning. Submission to God. Isaiah 30 verse 15 says, In repentance and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. You can write that out and put it on the fridge and look at it every day. It will be very helpful. In repentance and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and trust shall be your strength. You may be easily made anxious and agitated, intimidated by events. A sense of dread hanging over you concerning tomorrow. You know, always just around the corner is giant despair standing over you with his... like that ready to lock you up in his castle. You're worried. You're easily anxious. Giant despair is just around the corner. Your strength is being sucked out of you. You don't have the strength of the day. You're not refreshed. You are weak. And the reason you are weak is because you are not meek before God. Or perhaps you're easily fatalistic. This always happens to me. Why is it that every time I go out, this happens to me? Or every time I'm in a certain situation, just when I think things are going well, everything turns to custard. <laughs> oh, well, for you, everything turns to sticky rice. Like that. It just happens to me all the time. Well, the real problem is that you are weak. Goodbye. And the reason you are weak is that you are not meek, as was our Lord. Or you may have never thought while you are so easily irritated, Ugh. cross, bad-tempered. Well, the reason I can tell you the reason why I'm so easily irritated is because I have a strong personality, right? I'm, I'm a strong man. I have a strong personality. So that's why... I'm just easily irritated. Really? Proverbs 25, 28 says, A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. So that city is weak. So you're not strong because you're easily irritated and you have a strong personality. You are weak 
You are weak because you are not meek. Somewhere there is a fundamental lack of trust and submission to God. And that's why you're always touchy and hard to be around. Perhaps you're letting others make decisions that you that belong to you. If the husband is letting his wife control the finances, lead devotions, teach the children, pray with the children, and on and on, that's not because he's meek. It's because he's weak. Because ultimately, responsibility for the home lies with the husband. This is what you need to do. I'm going to give you the solution. This is what you need to do. Jesus said... Pastor Joseph read it. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am meek. Same word. I am meek and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, that's what Jesus is saying. And I've given you, and you, you're pretty familiar with the life of Jesus, how hard it was for him at times, that constant opposition, that constant antagonism, that constant criticism. But he said, my yoke, learn from me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. light. This is what you need to do. You need to yoke yourself to Jesus Christ. That is what Jesus is telling us to do. That is what Paul did. And Jesus is referring to something he'd seen many times, two oxen or two carabao, and the younger one is yoked together with the older one to train the younger one. So this is what we do. We yoke ourselves to Jesus Christ. As he lived life, so do we. We keep in step with him. As he faced adversity with all its ups and downs, so do we, under the hand of God and before men. And he will give you that strength to carry the load that comes from him. Yes, I know you have a load. I'm fully aware of that. You're not floating down a cool river in a canoe and the birds are singing. I'm fully aware that you carry a load. But Jesus will give you the strength to carry that load that comes from him when you yoke yourself together with Jesus. Don't work against him by seeking your own will, but work with him by submitting to his rule. There may be a strength in Jesus Christ that you don't have yet, that it will come with being meek. At the moment you might be thinking things are too hard, I'll never change. But change can happen. Change will happen. Jesus said, come and learn from me. So we can learn to become meek. We can learn to submit under the hand of God and under the hand of men. And from that meekness, you will have tremendous strength. And in a sense, you will inherit the earth. In a sense, in this life, because you will rule over your circumstances instead of your circumstances pushing you around all the time. Making you sad and unhappy and miserable because things are always going wrong. In a sense, you will rule over your life. And in the world to come, you will rule with him forever and ever and ever and ever. And the blessing will be yours forever and ever. Did I say forever? Yes, I mean it, forever. I'll close in prayer. Father, I pray that in your grace you might grant us help to learn from our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are profoundly grateful that we have a Saviour who didn't just tell us what to do, but who led the way and has gone before us as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And We pray, Father, you might grant us grace to follow in his footsteps, to follow closely 
to walk alongside and with him and to learn from him how we may live and live well, live well for our Savior in this troubled world. If we have failed in the past and we all have to forgive us, may we be strengthened for the day when we stand before you. Until that time, Lord, we say, come, Jesus, come and come quickly. Amen.